Today on the Performance Roundtable, we are speaking to Lee Waters. Lee has been lecturing for the past 10 years and on which he is predominantly working with sports psychology. On this episode, we discuss Lee's research and the benefits of eye training and the impact this has on decision making. So on that, let's begin. Hello, today we have Lee on the podcast and Lee can talk about his research. So hello, hello, Lee, and welcome to Quinn on. Thanks very much for inviting me on. Looking forward to talking about it. So you just want to out- outline your background, first of all, and what, you, what you've been, what you're currently doing and stuff like that? Yeah, so um, currently I'm a, I'm a senior lecturer, a sports psychology lecturer at University Centre Peterborough. I have been for just over 10 years now. Um, as I say, focused predominantly within the world of psychology, um, looking at both clinical sides of it, to the sports side, to the performance side. Um, but also looking at uh, perceptual motor skills and things like that. Um, I've not always been in academia, actually, to be perfectly honest. If I look at my younger self, I couldn't have thought of anything worse than getting into academia. Um, I wanted to be a footballer. I wanted to be an athlete, as a lot of a lot of people wanted to be. Uh, but unfortunately, like so many people, I got injured when I was younger, um, and it took me on a different path. And once I've said to, to many people before, I'm not even shy at the fact that I, uh, I don't think that I would have ever made it as a professional or anything like that. I wasn't that good. So it's not like I was a, I missed out on a great amount of things. But um, yeah, it took me on a different path. And I'm glad it did because it's made me investigate a variety of different things. Um, I've gone into uh, strength and conditioning. I've gone into um, now into psychology and trying to bring in the two the two parts together. So yeah, I'm looking forward to talking about where that's led me today uh, from my research. Yeah, sometimes the injury kind of is kind of lucky just because again we we know how good we are and where we would have made it. So having that awareness to understand that maybe we wasn't going to be that uh, star player, we might have you know maybe did it, did it right. Um, so yeah. Um, so on that research side, you want to outline what you're currently looking at? Because um, again, I really find it interesting. It's kind of really opened my eyes to some new stuff. Yeah, so currently I'm doing my PhD in, um, and I'm looking into the underlying mechanisms of decision making. Um, I'm in my, going into my fourth year, I would have been submitting my, my thesis in, within the next eight or, nine, eight or nine months, but with uh, good old COVID, unfortunately, that's been extended by a year because um, I've not been able to do any testing at the present moment in time. But it has allowed me to do other things, which, is, which has been good. So, yeah, I'm looking at the, the underlying mechanisms of decision making, specifically using eye tracker technology to see um, what officials are looking at when they're making offside decisions. Um, so the technology allows you to, to see what the environment is, what they're specifically looking at. Um, and then we're, during my research, I'm then doing some reflective pieces to see what kind of information they're getting from the environment and what they're actually looking at. So that's from my research side. I'm also looking at it from a practical side and I'm working with, with footballers as well um, to, in a variety of different settings, attacking um, and defending. Um, and then also I'm going to be working with ice hockey players in, in the not too distant future. Um, so that's from the practical side. Um, but mainly my research is looking at um, officials and what they're looking at when making an offside decision. So you said you work for many referees in terms of research. And then you work with obviously football players and go into ho- hockey. Um, when translating sort of the information to the players from the research, do you make them aware that it's coming from referee research? Or do you kind of just say, this is what we use for um, decision making and stuff like that? And kind of just leave out the participant side of it. Uh, well, the kind of when we're, when I'm working with um, officials, there's there's been a few bits and bobs, a few bits of research that has been conducted um, from from that side, but predominantly within labs and, and things like that. Um, so I am able to talk to them from an informed posi- informed position from that side. Um, it's not so much in the, the research hasn't been done so much in dynamic environments, which we're going to go into a little bit later. Um, but, but yeah, it's got, it's one of those things that we're trying, trying to generate a lot more information. There's only, um, there's not even really a hundred studies really using this technology within the, within the world of sport right now. Um, and that's typically because, um, the, the technology has only just started to be really mobile 
because before it was kind of fixated to a to either a desk or a, um, a computer or something like that. Um, so that's something we're kind of move, developing with. So just on that tangent is as a more experienced practitioner and then obviously within an area with so little sort of evidence, how do you kind of design your programs based off that? I feel as informed as possible because I know like a lot of new coaches, they'll either see sort of no ever like one study and run with it or they'll run away from it because there's only one study. It's not really useful. Um, I would argue that decision-making is the, the most important psychological process we go through. There's a variety of different constructs that can contribute to our decision-making process, but ultimately what we need to need to have to make a decision is to have information and to gain that information, depending on the situation, upwards of 90% of that comes from our eyes. Um, so if we need to make decisions, which is a very important thing to make a decision, we need information. And then to get that information that comes from our eyes, it's only logical that we understand what we're picking up, how we're picking it up, in what order. Um, is it right? Is it relevant? Is it irrelevant pieces of information? Um, so I kind of sell it that way. We need, we need information. We get it from our eyes and we need to make this decision, whether that be offside, whether it be, it be past the ball, whether it be walk across the street. Um, it's we get that information from our eyes. Yeah, so you take the, the logical route, the kind of, and it kind of normally it's right. If it's not, we, we carry on. We, yeah, we exactly. Um, yeah. So as you mentioned, not much research, but what does the current research sort of suggest in this sort of area? Yeah, so as I say, de depending on the environment, and that's a really, really key thing. Um, so that's one of the consistent things that has been, fought, it, been born out from the research. Um, it depends on what, how it affects our, what's known as gaze behavior. So our search patterns, um, our, our eyes moving from left to right, up and down, and, they, and they're called saccades, if you want to know the technical, uh, the technical term for it, um, regarded as the, the, the quickest uh, human movement that we have. Um, so it depends on the situation that we're kind of faced with. So if we are in a situation where we are targeting a stationary object, for example, um, we typically engage into something called quiet eye, which allows us to, uh, which is where we fixate. We spend much, a much longer time on the targets that we are, that we are aiming for. And that could be, for example, in archery, where we're, we're aiming for, the, for a target of, in a fair distance away, or it could be trying to kick a football um, uh, in a penalty situation, for example, because we are, the ball is stationary and we are hitting against a stationary object. Okay, we've got the keeper to, to kind of circumnavigate, um, but the, the most important thing at that point is making a sound contact with the ball. So we fixate on the ball at that situation. Um, as the situation becomes much more dynamic, that is when, and that's where I'm typically looking at in terms of the, um, in terms of offsides, that's where we start to get a little bit more um, into the elite uh, athletes, elite officials, uh, or the non-elite. So it could be that when things are starting, it's starting to become more dynamic, um, at the, at the lower end. So people that are not of experience, they'll be looking at everything. They'll be looking at grass. They'll be looking at the sky. They'll be looking at all kinds of, all kinds of things. Um, whereas the more elite will be quite key as to what they are looking at the pieces of relevant information that they pick up and they know will give them some vital pieces of information to make their next decision. So it's been, the, the, the studies that have been done have been done in uh, sports like tennis, so specifically on tennis serves and things like that. Um, there's been a, a recent study just in 2020 that was actually done within the world of football and in an actual an actual real life game, which is great, great for the great for the for the um, for the area because that's the first of its kind, um, which it would brought about some really really interesting results. Been done in rock climbing, for example, as well. Um, they actually came up with a really interesting terminology for gaze behavior, which was a zigzaggy approach <laughs> when trying to uh, when trying to um, go through a more um, a more difficult path 
when they were trying to, when the rock climbers were going through. So ultimately, one of the most common findings within the research is that it really depends on the environment as to what gaze behavior is then being displayed. And I want to reiterate that point because when we come into the, the next question, that's a really that's a really key point. You say about the kind of the, um, the higher level they are, they they know what to look at rather than just looking everywhere. Is that directly, I know obviously they won't have much eye training, but would that directly be trained through sort of uh, eye sort of awareness and decision making training? Or would it just come from experience in general? Or is it a bit of both? Um from from the from my participants, it in some ways it's been more more luck than judgment, being perfectly honest, in the sense that they've been feeling that they should do it that way. So they kind of have found their own own way of doing it, their own methods, their own their own patterns. Um, but they openly admit that actually if they'd have been given some guidance earlier on, maybe a few games before, maybe during training, they may have made some progress a little bit quicker. And that's ultimately what this kind of is, is trying to look at, trying to assist the training moving forward so people can make that progress much, much quicker. Um, so, yeah, that a lot of a lot of the, uh, the officials that I've actually come come across have not been aware that they actually have this gaze behavior. They're not been aware that they um, that they engage in such practices. Um, they didn't even know what it was called or what it is. So um, that that was something that that <clears throat> served as a little bit of an education, I guess, for, for, for the participants. What is the common mistakes in the research from either study design or how people interpret that research? Yeah, I just want to, just want to pick up on one of the points that you, ju you just made in terms of um, the, the there's there's a lot of fixation on some of the um, some of the decisions that that are made and, and things like that. I mean, the fit in my research is it's coming it's coming really really clear that officials have a really difficult job, a really yeah. difficult job to yeah. do um, because there are so so many factors going on, and it. It, whether that be whether that be um, players, whether that be emotions, whether that be the crowd when the crowd is actually there, um, whether that be the weather, there's so many factors to come into come into account um, with, with that, and they they have an incredible job, and there's so many things that they have to take into account, um, and for one person to have to to take in all of that information, it's really to be fair, it should be laudable of how much they're able to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because they they are they do a, re a really really good job. And unfortunately, but unfortunately, when they do make a mistake, it is really highlighted. Um, so that's so that's something that this research is really highlighting is that the amount of information that an official is having to take in to make this to make this decision, and that's where the, the findings of this is trying to help it. Um, in no way is it to, to kind of batter them over the head with a stick to say that they're not doing their job properly. Yeah. Um, is to try and help that. Um, but in answer to your question for this, uh, for, for this in terms of common mistakes, um, a, a, one of the most common mistakes is, is assumption um, in, the, in the general world, let's say. Um, someone's head is pointing one way or um, it's looking in one direction and there's an assumption that they are looking at something, they are looking at um, a, a, at a certain thing. Um, and this, this was something that was endorsed by um, different methods of training. So those sports that had helmets, um, so for example, ice hockey, for example, um, uh, American football, there would be a, a, a camera that got attached to, the, attached to the helmet and you would look around and there would, the coach would be able to use it because they could see what direction their players were looking in. And that's really, really useful because at least it gives the coach an idea of exactly the area that that player, that athlete is looking at, which is great. Um, but it doesn't give the exact piece of information of what they are looking at. And that's where the, that's where the eye tracker kind of comes in. So the eye tracker, I've said before, gives you the ability to pinpoint exactly where the person is looking at a given point in that given situation. So that's a really, really innovative piece of technology. Um, but with that, there is also been assumption that 
if someone is looking at something, they are also taking that, that information in and they're using that piece of information that they're looking at to then inform their next decision. Now, it's really key to highlight that the, the eye tracker technology tells us what they are looking at, eyesight potentially, but it doesn't necessarily tell, tell us what they're taking from it, their vision, their interpretation of it. And in, the, in the, this field, there's a, a common phrase, which is seeing is not always seeing. And that is where it is really important that when we are using this technology, especially from an application perspective, we know what the person is looking at, but also why they're looking at that. So what did they gain from that piece of information that they're looking at um, to then inform, inform their decision? There was a campaign a few years ago, and you'll still see the signs around, is that when drivers in a car come to a junction, um, there was the, the campaign of Think Bike because people were at, at junctions and they were looking left and they were looking right, straight forward, depending on the junction, and they were looking for cars, but they didn't necessarily see the bike. Even though the bike was there, it was quite clearly there. They, could, they would look at the bike, but they wouldn't register it. Um, and that's, that's what they were trying to do. It's called unintentional blindness. Um, and and that, could, that could happen. So if you are just using the eye tracker technology, there does become an assumption of what people are looking at. And that can become a problem if it's not then reflected upon. And what you mentioned before going to bone blindness is the, um, the NFL players on the helmet, helmet cams. In rugby union, the refs have a, like a, a cam as well. Mm-hmm. But they, they never show, the only other time they show is when they're speaking to players, you get a close up of um, the captain's like face. But I think if they actually showed what the refs see, like what they, they see when they're making like tough decisions, mm-hmm. there might be some sympathy for the refs in some like the, um, the harsher decisions when they, it's what they've seen or, you know, what their direction they're looking at. Mm-hmm. And then obviously you can make assumptions from that, but I don't think they're using that sort of camera as efficiently as they could. Because at the moment, he's literally just whenever having a conversation with a ref, you see a close up of the captain's chest. When he's when he got he got that information there, it could be used now and again just to highlight when they score a try, what angle did the ref see it from? Why did they give a try or not a try? And he might again give some more um, not credibility, but just relatedness to the ref and see what they see because, as you said, he's, they see everything. But, yeah, I think it's I think it's an interesting point because then there needs to be some some recognition of the the environment that that officials are coming across. And there's so many things, so many things going on, so many things to see. And you're absolutely right. They've, they've got that ability to be able to show, show that going on right, right in front of them. Um, so that would, be, that would be something to, to kind of show. And even from a training point of view for future, future refs, they can see then what the like refs of the highest level are looking at. So they have sort of a, oh, this is what, well, when I'm playing, I'm going here, here, here. When the Super League or the Premier well, when I say Super League, I mean Rugby League. I know it's a bit touchy subject at the moment. Um, but the, the, the premise or anything like that, they can see what they're doing. So they can go, oh, that's what I want. To, I need to do. I need to be more selective with my, with my sort of vision. Um, and then again, like you said, then on that un- unintentional blindness, um, I think that's very... Do the, When the, the studies write that up, are they aware of that? Or do the studies kind of ignore that factor? Uh, sorry, are the, are the participants aware of that? No, no, so with aware? research, when they write it up, is that normally listed in the kind of the considerations or is it kind of glossy? Yeah, it's one of, it's typically one of the limitations that is then cited uh, at the end of, at the end of the research, uh, the research article. Um, it's, it, yeah, it's one of those that um, is acknowledged. It's not something that's just kind of breezed over and it's no one's talking about it. It is something that, that is acknowledged. Um, but typically you can come at it from, um, obviously, you can come at it from quantitative numbers, qualitative words. Um, you can combine the two, and and that's the that's the, the the key part and the uniqueness, I guess, of, of the research that I'm doing because I am combining the two. I'm looking at it from 
what and the numbers and how many fixations, saccades, eye movements are, are going on. But I'm also looking at it as a key reflective piece as to why they're doing that and why they're engaging in such a, such a practice. Now, on, also on the research, I was talking earlier quite, um, quite explicitly about it depends on the environment as to um, the gaze behavior that you see quite a lot of the research has been conducted in labs, has been conducted using screens, using clickers as to when they see some piece of information on, this, on the screen, um, they then have to click a button or, or something like that. Now, because that's an unrepresentative design, it's not, it's not realistic in the sense that it's not something that is being seen in the real world. It doesn't take into account one, the, the size of the, the environment that they potentially will be faced with, i.e. a football pitch, a rugby pitch, a hockey rink, a tennis court. Um, it doesn't take into account things like fatigue. So as, it, as you go through a game, uh, you will start to feel a level of fatigue. But if you're just sat there, then you're not necessarily going to go through an element of physical fatigue. So that's something to take into consideration as well. Maybe even the external stimuli, the variety of different things. Mm. A bird might start chir chirping behind you, or it might just distract you for that brief second. And all of a sudden, because of that, you miss a little piece of information. So those, those things um, are a key part of, of, of the research that has been done in the past, or a key limitation of some of the things that have been done. It's not to say that those findings aren't really interesting because they have really, really brought about some interesting results. And typically they have been done in labs because the technology hasn't been as mobile as it is now. And it's only been the last few years that it has been mobile and available to be able to be put into these more dynamic environments. And, and hopefully there's more consistency with that as we go forward within this. No, they've, they've kind of laid the, the foundations of the future research, which always needs to be acknowledged. And mm -hmm. it's kind of ones is in 10 years, 15 years, they've probably got little chips. You can look at everything you see. Um, we need to be aware that that was what they had at the time. I know that sometimes in reading research, or this research is useless now because technology's moved on. It's, well, no, you can still read it. You can still learn from it. Mm -hmm. And understanding the whys behind it, I think are really important. Because as I heard, first heard about it from a, another podcast where, on about an athlete that was great and everything, but he was struggling in one area because he couldn't, get, couldn't, he could keep dropping the ball or doing something like that, and then he was just working with someone like yourself, and that's what helped him. Not in, not doing extra training, not doing extra this in terms of like just because his awareness of the pictures was amazing. He was just he was not seeing what he thought he was seeing sort of thing. Um, and the next question was be where do you see this research being used? I know we've kind of touched on it already, but where do you see it really being used in the future? Yeah, I mean, with with my research specifically, because of the participants that I'm using, it's predominantly grassroots of, uh, officials. So the findings lend itself more to the to, to that level of uh, of official, which is which is great, which is really beneficial because it allows trainers, it allows the officials to be able to kind of implement things quicker, or that's the intention anyway. Rather, this is a key part of the training because they already deliver some really, really great training. Um, but this is just another layer to kind of add to it. If you work on this element of, um, of your game, you'll make quicker strides. That would be, the, that would be kind of the aim. Um, so trying to make the training in this regard more structured, make officials aware that it actually exists would be a, would be a good thing. <laughs> Um, that would that would be a start um, rather than it just being a case of I'll just look at things and I'll try and find my own way as to as to what it is I mean ultimately that that is how it will get to they find their own way of becoming more structured they become they become uh, aware of what pieces of information they need to gain in each environment um, so that's uh, that's something that eventually happens but we can get them to that point a lot a lot lot quicker the, the technology is advancing all of the time. I mean, the first ever eye, track, uh, eye tracker technology was, was built over 100 years ago where the, it would it, it literally touch your eye. And so as your eyeball moved, 
uh, kind of a pointer would move um, on another on, on another piece, and I can't imagine that being very comfortable <laughs> at all. But now it's moved on to the point where all you need to all you need to wear is the glasses, and all you need to have accompanying that is effectively a mobile phone. So you you hook that onto your shorts or your trousers or whatever you're wearing, and you can quite happily run around and you can. You can do you can go about your business in your in your given environment so now the technology is getting more advanced more streamlined more mobile the idea i'm hoping within this research and it's certainly where i'm looking at it in for my own practical for my own practice is getting it into to more applied representative design studies um, because as you correctly say the, the groundwork has been done by some of the uh, by some of the the lab stu the lab studies and they should never be forgotten i'm a fond believer in that in order to go, to move forward we need to know where we've been and this is a great point for that because we need to know where the current research is and where the the new bits can be then added on in advance and uh, advanced things so those those earlier studies shouldn't be forgotten um for me personally, I'd like to access more elite officials moving forward. What, what is the definitive difference between an elite official and a grassroots official? That would be, it'd be great to, to, to make those definitive comparisons. Um, I'd also like to work a little bit more with, with players from a football sense or from, uh, as I say, potentially going into ice hockey. From, uh, from rugby perspectives and seeing what it's like in all those other, in all those other kind of dynamic environments. So again, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but with the sort of what I potentially use for it, I don't think it's possible, but with refereeing, to train refereeing, you'd need at least a certain amount of people to be able to make decisions. Do you feel this eye tracker technology and this sort of awareness could potentially lead to a solo star training? Well, I know so the lab work isn't really representative, representative, but maybe using the tracker technology or not, he's doing some more using a computer or a device to make decisions so that they're not requiring 20 people to go and set up a certain scenario. And that yeah. might, because if you think of the training age of most referees, they might train once a week with their like local community sort of refs and then um, play a game every Saturday in terms of that actual decision making so the actual training time again you can correct me if i'm wrong would seem quite low so there would be a reasonable doubt to say well reasonably reasonable to say they might have made errors as mm -hmm. when i refed i ref three games in my life never doing it again um but i made errors because it's not something i used to and i've done that i went straight into it i've refed like touch games in you know, in training in coaching but then trying to full game when everything's going on it's like you said completely different when parents are screaming at you because their kids have been sent off or something like that it's a different story so do you feel that this could be used for a solo training or yeah absolutely i think it's it's really interesting because uh, one of the greatest strengths of my study is the fact that it is in a representative design i'm using real players i'm using a real pitch <laughs> I'm using um, a real, real grass, all, all of this kind of stuff. So it's, it's in a representative design. It's the, it's the greatest strength of the study. For me personally, as a researcher, it's also the, the, the biggest downfall because trying to organize all of those moving parts is really, really problematic. Trying to get the pitch book, trying to get the team to come into at the same time, trying to get the officials to come in at the same time. Uh, it's I can 100% also understand why this kind of research doesn't happen all of the time because there's a lot a lot of moving parts moving on to can it be used as solo training a absolutely I think it would be I think it would be really really advantageous you wouldn't necessarily need to use the eye tracker technology in that solo training um, because it tells you what you're doing in the given environment but what you can do outside of the outside of the the, the 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 training that you do with teams with with the setups is what you can do is eyesight and vision training which is it's things that is quite often overlooked it doesn't it doesn't often get get used it doesn't often get um get get um get acknowledged 
the fact that in order to to pick up information we would we train our eyes i mean heaven forbid that we, we do that um if you go and want to do some speed training you potentially might do some do some stuff on your hamstrings um for example but if we want to kind of pick up more information through our eyes people just it doesn't seem to always be a common thing to say okay i need to do some eyesight training or i need yeah. to do some vision training and that can be done in a variety of different ways uh, that it can be used you can use all kinds of things uh cards you can use a, a deck of playing cards yeah um all, all kinds of things and do you see one that's been used but the research taking advantage of esports with obviously the funding in esports the availability of the athletes to actually just watch what they're doing and see how they react to stuff is and probably be more uh, inclined to take on technology than traditional sports because they're using it um so do you see esports being a massive sort of um pusher in this sort of technology yeah i, I do i do think think it's neat it's a very very interesting one because um i know that there's also there's already technology available for eye tracking and virtual reality to be already combined in the same head in the same headset so you can be in an environment in a virtual environment as well as have the eye tracker technology combined to see exactly what they're looking at so being honest if you can get a game situation downloaded virtually then if it's being hailed as a as a um as a method for training i mean quarterbacks have been using it for for a good good few seasons now it's now resel for example i don't know if you've heard of resel but they they they're doing some fantastic things um with a variety of different football clubs not only football but in other sports as well um but they're doing some fantastic stuff with virtual reality um from from a player perspective so the same could be done from an official's perspective um download the download the game scenario get them into a um, into a linesman's position in my case or the man in the middle woman in the middle um and then get them into those in those different situations so in that sense it could quite easily be put into a solo training method um as well because uh, when i've been to a few esports coaches and they've said a lot of the research is going one way at the moment it's going from like formula 1 and sports like that mm. and to to esports soon hopefully the it will be reversed and a lot of research will come from esports especially in areas like this. The last one on this sort of bit of training wise is, do you train uh, a, a rugby player, football player, hockey player, ref, a ref differently in terms of eyesight? Is it kind of the general to the size the end, towards the end or how does that look like? It, it completely depends on, on the individual and also once again, the, the environment that they're in. Like, like any physiological training program, you're not, um, you, you're not going to do certain things within certain, within certain contexts. however it does really depend on the individual's eyesight at that point which you can do some simple tests um we've all gone to the opticians we've all gone and done uh, a snellen chart and uh the the letters and the the numbers on the board and and see what we can see to to which level uh we can test our eye dominance we can see whether we're more left eye dominant right eye dominant and we can see we can test our depth perception how our ability to be able to to see things close and then quick, quickly to a to to a distance through these tests we would then be able to train it differently depending on that person because if they are for example if they are what is considered to be binocular i.e they're using both eyes at the same equal measure um that's considered to be a good thing that's an optimal point um we wouldn't necessarily need to focus on on splitting the eyes and turn it in focusing on focusing on one eye more than the other we'd use them simultaneously but if they were considered to be more one eye dominant we would then need to um focus a little bit more on say the left eye for example um so so it does it does depend on those initial tests for that given individual like it, it like it does for any physiological yeah. training program it, it's exactly the same principle it's the exact same concept um and it's it's just in a it's just in a different context yeah and i feel like yeah, that's very important is just 
it is very easy as strength coaches to kind of disconnect from this. I'd see it as a, like a completely different mm-hmm. skill, but like you just said, you get a test, see what you need doing, and then just train around that so individual mm-hmm. individualization. So on that is what else would you like to look at in this area of research? So what you mentioned before about more practical studies and stuff like that, but is there anything else you think would be quite interesting to look at? Yeah, so, so I'm, I, I, to being honest, I've gone a, bit, a little bit down a rabbit hole in terms of in terms of eyesight and vision, in terms of trying to train it, in trying to in terms of trying to look at um, how we improve those aspects. So that's definitely an area that I'm going into in in trying to improve our eyesight, our vision. Can it be done pro- properly, more effectively? Because um, it, it can be done. It's just a c- case of trying to work out the best way of doing it. Um, and then how that then affects our gaze behavior, our, our tracking, our search behaviors, our ability to pick up information. Like I've said before, want to do more representative studies, more representative design studies, um, moving away from labs, moving away from those, those, uh, those set settings. I want to move into a more dynamic environment. Um, as the technology develops, potentially, I mean, there are there, there is talk of um, uh, contact lenses being used for the uh, eventually, kind of in a few years' time. I mean, that would just be that would just be amazing. Um, also, this this whole concept it, it was brought up recently within the uh, within the news, uh, especially ironically, it's, it involved Man United again. <laughs> In terms of um, Old Trafford, they had banners around the around the the, the lower tier of uh, of Old Trafford, and they were finding it difficult when they quickly looked up to differentiate the diff- their their players, their teammates from the banner behind because they were both red. Yeah. And although it would only take them another point one of a second, point two of a second to to identify whether it was their teammate or the banner, that could be the difference between being able to execute a pass or losing possession. Yeah. So, so I'd like to look into to a little bit more into that really as well as to how the environment really affects of our visual uh, visual perception, um, because that can be key as well. Because I say ironic that it's Man United again because they there's that infamous time that uh, the kit was changed when when Man United played Southampton and they were um, I think they were three they were three nil down and they changed from the gay the, the gray the gray kit because they couldn't see their um, couldn't, couldn't see their, their players and that was borne out by an eye coach as well that that finding was borne out by an eye coach but that was more not necessarily seeped in research that was more from application from from the stuff that they were doing already. So I'd like to look a little bit more into that for me personally. So on this about looking at the test in your the research at the moment is like in sort of strength or speed or fit, especially fitness testing in sort of like rugby, there's that debate of the closed tests like your yo-yos and your broncos, stuff like that, that don't really reflect the game. Mm-hmm. So it, although they might give you a nice fancy score and might give you something to potentially work from, there's plenty of athletes that do really bat poorly on these broncos or yo-yo the bleep mm-hmm. tests well then the workhorses in the game now would be, be that just the tests aren't specific enough or the so it's the environmental factors of the adrenaline or the mindset they've got into that game day like mm-hmm. um eddie hall when he lifted the 500k deadlift on his documentary said he was imagining um he was lifting the car off his family mm-hmm. he had to get, which, and in training i only think he lifted like 450 in training so mm-hmm. that external factor of like tra- game day could have a massive difference to the, the effectiveness mm. of what that test is actually testing for. Um, but on sort of the sunglass, uh, the contact lenses, I've always had an idea. I don't know what it's not been done yet. You might tell me why, but sunglasses and contact lenses, they'd be so useful for athletes, in like, especially <laughs> like athletic tennis or something. Like that. I've always wondered why there's never been sunglass contact lenses. Um, there might be a reason for that might affect your vision in some other ways, but when you like playing rugby, there's a high ball and there's like, the sun's in your eyes. And you're thinking, I mm. wish I had glasses on right now. Mm. But yeah, so that's just on that. No, it's, it's, a, fair, it's a fair point. And I, I'm being honest, I don't, have, I don't have the definitive answer for that. I would, I would automatically assume, because it hasn't been done, um, that it would 
be in line with what you said in terms of it could hinder <clears throat> um, their actual their actual ability to see stuff. Yeah, um, I would assume that, but I I couldn't categorically say. But it's a very interesting idea. I haven't thought of that to be perfectly honest. I've, I've had that idea since I was like fifteen. No, but it's okay. It's been great having you on. Um, like I said, th- this area of research is something I'm definitely going to look at more into. Um, because it, I, I, gotta, I don't know when you wouldn't. Would you use this as a separate session or would you use it as a warm up for like yeah, and it's, for, for physiological sessions? Yeah, it's a great it's a great question because I think I think the, th- the thing and this is this is the the same with psychology it, um, more traditional psychology is that because they're seen as separate disciplines, a lot of people consider the having to be taught at different points. So or not necessarily taught, but they're having to implement the session at different stages. Actually, it can be ingrained quite nicely together, whether it be physiological, whether it be from an eye perspective, whether it be psychological, they can all be combined. So when you're looking at things like um, trying to improve this, you can engage something something simple as, as brain endurance training. So you're getting them to a point of physical fatigue so they're having to do something relatively high intensity. They will potentially then leave that physiological high intensity element. And then they would have to go away and then go to the sideline and potentially then have to do some sums, do some problem solving activities, do, do something that taxes them cognitively and then go back into that physiological part again so you're trying to use the brain and the the, the body at the same at the same time so, so it becomes psychophysiological um you can f- specifically from an from an eye perspective you can use this yes as a warm-up and i would i re- recommend it as as the, as a little bit of a warm-up so for for different i know um Within rugby, set, within rugby sessions, the ones that do embrace it, they use different size balls. Yeah. So different size balls to to try and get their eye in, so to speak. Um, so they'll use tennis balls, they'll use bouncy balls, they'll use um, different shaped balls, they'll use massive, they'll use core balls, all kinds of stuff, just to try and get people looking at the relevant things to to gauge distances, speed, get their eye in to be able to catch that ball and then quickly move it on. Um, and that would be just a simple thing that, that, that could be ingrained into training sessions. Um, but on the sort of the, the, the train with the small balls or the bouncy balls, it reminds when I was in college, we used soap, uh, wash nut gloves and a rugby ball. And every time the ball dropped, we had to put it in there. Now, I don't yeah. know if they did that for that reason or it was just hands, but it made a quite interesting game where we had to play around rugby, wash nut gloves and soap all over it. And it was obviously slippy. Uh, and then dip it back in the bucket every time you made a mistake or something like that. Uh, but it's just an interesting sort of story there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you might use it in your future training. If you see, soap, <laughs> if you see the washing up gloves come out, I know, I know I've made an impact. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. Um, but no, he's going to say it's been great having you on. So the last question is, on a f- any future episodes, who would you like to see in terms of a guest or a researcher or even a topic you'd like to see discussed that I can try and look into? Yeah, I, I would, to be perfectly honest, like uh, to, to discuss what what we literally just been discussing ju- uh, last year in terms of brain endurance training, the combination of um, of psychology training alongside the physiological side. I think that for, for me personally, I don't necessarily think that is embraced as as much as it as much as it could be. Um, and I'd love to hear I'd love to hear from practitioners that that successfully do that. Um, and get that uh, get that um, nice that nice blend um, because I know they're out there and, there and there's some out there that do a fantastic job um, because but I, I just I would think that it would benefit a lot of people to get the the combination in um, in more ready supply so to speak. I think the current the the problem and the benefit of SNC coach at the moment is that there's no defined job title. We are the analysts, with the psychologists, with the nutritionists, with the strength coaches, with the field coaches, with the technical coaches. Sometimes it's really hard for, especially a new SNC coach, to find out like yourself. You went from SNC to psych, um, to kind of go for that direction, and then but still stay as SNC coach. 
a lot of the times it's they find a new love and it's like, oh, I want to go psychology, I want to go rehab. And they'll go all to that. And that'll be where they, they kind of lend themselves to because um, they might be able to find a new job opportunity there. But from what I've seen, I know a lot of coaches are, like myself, are trying to nick bits from everywhere. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a generalist, not a specialist. So I'm trying to nick bits from everywhere and put them in. And with people like yourself that are practical and, and researcher, it kind of, it kind of what's called showing that it can be done. It's not just, this is what the research says, do something with it. You're actually going, well, this is what the research does. This is what we're trying to make it practical. And this is how I use it. So that's what's really good. Great to, great to have you on. So uh, yeah, thanks for that. And um, I'm sure it'll, I've got a lot to say now. <laughs> thanks for coming on. <laughs> and, uh... Thank you for listening to the podcast. If you want to keep up to date with episodes and updates regarding the channel, please follow our social media accounts. We are Performance Roundtable Podcast on YouTube at Adam Bromley 12 on Twitter and A to B Conditioning on Instagram. If you want to contact me, you can reach out on any of the platforms I listed above or just message me on LinkedIn under Adam Bromley. Again, I appreciate everyone for watching and getting to this part of the program. So I look forward to seeing you next week.